God. You know, in church, we talk about grace. We use the term grace. But as a Christian, have you ever tried to understand the concept of grace? Well, think about it like this. When a person works an eight hours day and receives a fair day's pay for his time, that's called a wage. When a person competes with an opponent, and receives a trophy for his performance. That's what we call a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long-time service or high achievements, that's what we call an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize and deserves no award, yet receives such a gift anyway. That is a picture of God's unmerited favor. That is what we mean when we talk about God's grace. Some have defined grace as God's free favor and spontaneous action towards needy sinners to deliver and transform them. Others have said that grace is God's lavish favor on undeserving sinners. Some have said that grace is the unmerited favor of God towards sinners like you and me. I've heard some take the word grace, the G, the R, the A, the C, and the E, and use those letters to say that grace is is God's riches at Christ's expense. I don't know about you, but I am thankful for God's amazing grace. Last week, we began a series of messages. This is Thanksgiving season. And we preached on the subject of being thankful for God's work of salvation. This week, I want to bring you a message that the Lord has placed upon my heart titled, Thankful for God's Amazing Grace. Thankful for God's Amazing Grace. And if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Titus chapter number 2. The book of Titus chapter number 2. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you, then feel free to follow along on the screen. Titus chapter number 2. And we want to begin reading with verse number 11. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. There's 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, then Titus. Titus. Titus 2 verse 11. The Bible says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. In these verses that we've read this morning, the Apostle Paul explains to us the tremendous accomplishments of God's amazing grace in the life of a believer. So what does grace accomplish? What is it that God's grace accomplishes in my life? What is it that God's grace accomplishes in your life? Well, in this message, I want to share with you a couple of the accomplishments of God's grace And I pray that each of you this morning 
will be moved to give thanks to our God for His amazing grace. First of all this morning, God's grace brings salvation. God's amazing grace brings salvation. You notice in verse 11, it is the grace of God that brings salvation. Political and world leaders cannot bring salvation. Man's philosophical or sociological ideas cannot bring salvation. Education or legislation cannot bring salvation. Science and technology with all of its advancements cannot bring salvation. It's only God's amazing grace that can and does bring salvation for sinners like you and me. When we think about salvation, that term salvation, the literal word there means deliverance. When you're speaking of God's amazing grace that brings salvation, literally God brings to us deliverance from the punishment for our sin. Deliverance from the power and the pull of sin in our lives. Deliverance one day from the very presence of sin. Deliverance from the spiritual and eternal consequences of sin. Deliverance by Almighty God from eternal destruction. God's grace brings salvation to you and to me. Now, how does God bring this a salvation to us? Well, it comes through Christ. Notice in verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. The idea there of salvation appearing refers back to a definite time and place in the past where God manifested to the world His salvation. And you know when God done that? He done that when His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was born of a virgin Mary, born in a stable, laid in a manger. And you remember when His parents took Him to the temple, Simeon and Anna recognized that there the Lord Jesus Christ was God's salvation right before them. The Lord Jesus, His earthly life revealed to us God's salvation. His atoning work on the cross made God's salvation possible and available for you and for me. This salvation comes through Jesus Christ. But also I noticed something else in that verse. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. In other words, that verse is saying right there that this salvation that God gives by grace is for all people. It's provided for all types of people in all generations and from all classes. But listen, even though God's salvation is provided for all people, its saving effect is dependent upon the personal response of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Warren Wiersbe that made the statement, There is a universal need and God provided a universal remedy for all who would believe. Salvation comes by God's grace. I read a story how during the Spanish-American War, Theodore Roosevelt came to Clara Barton of the Red Cross to buy some supplies for his sick and wounded men. He sent a request and then his request was refused by Miss Barton. Roosevelt was troubled and he went to her and he said, How can I get these things? I must have the proper supplies and food for my sick men. Clara Barton said, Just ask, Colonel. Oh, said Mr. Roosevelt, Then I do ask for them. And he got them at once through grace. And they were given to him not by a purchase, but simply as a gift when he asked for them. 
You see, friends, salvation is provided for all. It's available by all. But as such, it must be received as a gift. It's received when you call on the name of the Lord for salvation and believe on Him for your salvation. Titus chapter 3, verse number 3. Look at these verses here. The Bible says in the next chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom He had poured on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you see that? Salvation is not something you can work for. It's not something that you can do enough to get. It is something that God gives, and He gives it by grace when you place your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. God's amazing grace brings salvation. And then number two, I see in these verses another accomplishment of God's grace. God's amazing grace teaches us how to live for Him in this present age. Look at verse number two. Now when we're thinking about this age that we live in, Galatians 1 and 5 tells us that this age is an evil age. And I think many of us would definitely agree with that. The Bible also tells us how that this age will try to make you and me fit into its mold. And it will try to push on us to accept its standards and ideas and philosophies and ways. However, the believer must live in this present age, but we don't have to let this present age influence us. Because we, according to Hebrews 6, 5, we've tasted of the powers of the age to come. The age to come. Now, as we're thinking about God's grace teaching us how to live in this age, look at verse 12. Paul writes, teaching us. The word teaching there. Uh, has the idea of a loving parent, a loving father, a loving mother coming alongside their child and teaching them, instructing them, encouraging them, correcting them, modeling before them. Paul is saying that by grace... We are being taught how to live in this age and specifically what we should not do in this age. Look at that, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. The idea there is to say no, to renounce, to abandon, to refuse. Paul is saying by grace the believer learns to avoid to say no to renounce ungodliness. The term ungodliness there literally means irreverence. It means anything unlike God. And then Paul says worldly lust. The idea of worldly lust speaks of the cravings of this world systems, those cravings that separate us from God. And he's saying as a believer, the grace of God teaches us at the moment we trust Christ, we have an instructor, we have the Holy Spirit that moves in our heart like a, a parent, and he instructs us by God's grace to say no once and for all to ungodliness and worldly lust. But also, you know, as believers that each... And every day the Holy Spirit walks beside us and He helps us live the Christian life showing us what we need to avoid and say no to. Not only there that grace teaches us what we should not do, but grace teaches the believer what they should do. Do you see that? Paul says in verse 12, we should live 
soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. The term soberly there speaks of living a self-controlled life. This is the believer's inner life. The believer lives by the control of the Holy Spirit, not the control of their own mind or own desires or outer influences, but we're controlled, we're restrained by the Holy Spirit. And then not only that's uh, how He works on us inwardly, we see the term righteously. The term righteously there means upright, faithful, in fulfilling all of demands of truth and justice in our relations with others, living right and doing right by those around us. This is how the grace of God teaches us to live outwardly with other people. And then Paul says the grace of God tells us that we should live godly. Godly. The term godly there means reverently, fully devoted to God in reverence and loving obedience. So the grace of God tells us what we should do and what we should not do. There's both a positive and a negative to this. I heard one time of a little boy and somebody walked up to him and said, Son, what is your name? And he said, my name is Don't. You see, he had heard from his mom and daddy, Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go over here. And so the little boy heard that constant command to him that he began to believe that that was his name. Well, I want to tell you in the Christian life, it's not all about what we are not to do, but it is also about what we are to do. You see, the grace of God not only uh, cuts sin out of our life, the grace of God opens the door for us to live a godly life that honors and pleases Him. We have that wonderful privilege. As believers, we're not under the Old Testament law or bound to it. But this does not mean, folks, that we have a license to sin or do whatever we want to. Hold your place there in Titus and turn with me over to Romans chapter number 6. Look in Romans chapter number 6. I want to read you a couple of verses from there. Romans chapter number 6. And let's look at verse Number 1, Romans chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now skip on down to verse 15. Look at verse 15. What then... Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. Do you see the idea there? Yes, we're saved by grace. Yes, we're being taught by grace. Yes, we are under God's grace. It is working in our life. But grace is not a, the privilege to do whatever you want to do, but it is the power to do what we ought to do. Amen. It's the power to do what we ought to do. God's grace teaches us how to live for Him in this present age. And then number three, there's another accomplishment of God's grace here in Titus chapter number two. And that is God's amazing grace gives us a bright future. A bright future. Now look with me at verse number 13. Paul begins with that word looking, looking. The idea here in this verse number 13 is looking, waiting with expectancy. 
And as believers, it should be the state of mind and life to be ready at all times to welcome our returning Lord. Right now, we're saved by grace. Right now, in this present age, we're learning to live the Christian life by God's grace. He's working with us as a parent does patiently, uh, kindly, uh, with a heart that loves us. He is working, teaching us to live by His grace. And as we're living by His grace, we also have planted in our heart the hope that we're going to see Jesus face to face one day by grace. Now, look with me, looking for that blessed hope. Now, Paul here is speaking of a future day of consummation. Now, do you see that word hope in our text in verse number 13? Now, in our English language, the word hope, we use it to speak of wishful thinking. Uh, some of you kids will be using that term thinking, I hope I get that certain toy that I saw on the television. I hope that, well, when I was a kid, it was the J.C. Penney Christmas catalog. Do y'all remember those? The toy catalog. I hope I get that toy out of that Christmas J.C. Penney catalog. As adults, we still use the word hope in that way. I hope this morning while I'm going to work, yeah, I'm running a little behind. I hope all the red lights are green this morning. Do you know what I'm saying? Wishful thinking. But in the Bible, the word hope, when the Apostle Paul speaks of a hope that we have, when the New Testament writers speak of the believers having a hope, it's not speaking of wishful thinking. The biblical use of the word hope means an assured expectation, an absolute certainty. Something that is within us that we know is going to happen. It's guaranteed. It's planned. It's set in stone. It's kind of like if you have, have a ticket to a ball game at a stadium and that ticket has the row and the seat number, the section number. And when you get there, you hold that ticket in the hand till you get there and that ticket is the guarantee that there's a seat that is reserved. It's going to be there. You don't have to hope it'll be empty. You have the hope because you have in hand the promise. And you see, that's with the believer. As believers, our future is not wishful thinking. It's not thinking, well, it may happen, it could happen. No, for the believer, we have the hope, the assured expectation of a bright future. One day Jesus will return. This will be a day of consummation when we see the one who loved us, the one who bled and died for us, the one who was buried and rose again for us, and thank God that same one is coming back for us one day after a while. We have the hope of seeing Him. And this mortal will put on immortality. This body that is corruptible will take on an incorruptible body. This body that's made in the likeness of Adam, that comes from Adam in that fallen state, will one day be transformed into the likeness of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a hope of a bright future. That's why Paul called it a blessed hope. The word blessed there means happy and fortunate and well-favored. And yes, we as believers, we certainly have something to look forward to. A future day of consummation where our hope will not just be an expectation, but one day be a reality. It'll be a reality. And then Paul goes on to say not only that... As believers in our future, there's a day of consummation, but it will be in our future a day of vindication. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul here is describing not only the believer's hope, 
how when Jesus returns one day as King of kings and Lord of lords, we will rejoice. Our faith will become sight. Our hope will become a reality. But also on that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When they see Him coming one day, He'll return in power and great glory and all the world will finally recognize, accept and admit that Jesus is the Son of the living God. The Bible speaks of this. Now Jesus is unrecognized. Now Jesus is disregarded by the world. But one day when He returns, His eternal glory given to Him by the Father will be visible by all one day. Have you ever heard someone say about a young person that's just graduating high school or graduating college will sometimes say, well, they sure have a bright future ahead of them. Maybe you've even made that statement about someone before. We make those comments because of the person's hard work, the person's academic ability, the person's skills, the person's talents, their mannerisms, their motivation, maybe even their family heritage. However, when it comes to the believer, we have a bright future and it has nothing to do with who we are. It has nothing to do with what we are. It has nothing to do with what we have or what we have done or what we will do. But it has everything to do with God and what He has done for us by His amazing grace. For those who've never accepted God's amazing grace in their future, the Bible describes it's filled with continual, eternal gloom and darkness. In their future, they're headed towards an ending that is hopeless in this life. For the unbeliever, they're headed towards a future of judgment and separation from God. They're headed for hell for all eternity. However, for those who've received God's gift of grace, their future is bright. Their future will be in the presence of Christ. Their future is going to be one of unending worship and celebration around the throne of God. Their future is filled with peace, love, joy, and holiness. The believer's future is in God's eternal kingdom where Jesus rules and reigns in righteousness forever and forever. As believers, as believers, folks, uh, that those of us who've received God's gift of grace, I've got good news for you this morning, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. God's grace gives us a bright future to look forward to. And then there's one more accomplishment of God's amazing grace that I see in our text. And that is this. God's grace makes us His special people. God's grace makes us His special people. Notice in verse number 14... He describes his own special people. Here Paul is speaking of a people who belong to God, a people who love God, a people who serve God, a people who are loved by God, a people who have been saved by God, a people who are going home one day to live with Him forever. And Paul here is saying that by grace, as his special people, we have a new freedom. Now, verse 14 tells us that this new freedom is made possible through the redeeming blood of Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us. Speaking of the Lord Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross, he dying on our behalf in our place. Why? That He might redeem us from every lawless deed. Notice the word redeem there in our text. It means to be set free by paying a price. Paul says that we're set free from every lawless deed. 
Jesus Christ shed His blood so that we could be redeemed from the lawless deeds of our heart. That which dominates us, that which is rebellion towards God, Jesus provided a redemption to purchase us from the domination of sin. And then this new freedom is made possible not only by the redeeming blood of Christ, but the purifying blood of Christ. The text here says that He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people. As sinners, you and I are morally defiled, yet the blood that Jesus shed makes us clean before God. We are now clean and fit to live in freedom and to serve our new Master. As His special people, we have a new freedom. As His special people, we have a new drive. Notice verse number 14, the last phrase. Paul says, us, His special people, will be zealous for good works. Notice that word zealous there. It literally means eager. It means enthusiastic. And uh, here in the context, it means to be enthusiastic to serve and work for Him. I love the verses over in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10 says, For we, listen, are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He saved us that we might serve Him. He saved us that we might work for Him. Grace is something we can't repay. Grace is something we can't earn. But out of gratitude and thanksgiving in our heart, we can serve our Master, Jesus Christ. I read a story, and I close with this. I read a story how back in the 1800s, a young Englishman traveled to California in search of gold. And after several months of prospecting, he struck it rich. And on his way back home from California, he came down through New Orleans and stopped there. And when he was in the town of New Orleans one evening, he recognized a crowd of people that were gathered for what it sounded like an auction. And as he walked up to see what was going on, he noticed that it was a slave auction. He started hearing the word sold just as he joined the crowd. And he saw a middle-aged black man taken away by someone. Then he saw a young, beautiful girl who was pushed up on to the platform and then the bidding began within moments the bids surpassed what most slave owners would pay for a young girl but the bidding continued higher and higher and then there was one man who stepped up and he raised a bid for a price that was beyond the reach of the others and the little girl looked down at the auctioneer and the auctioneer called out, Going once, going twice. And just before the final call, the man from England, he yelled out a price that was exactly twice the previous bid. The auctioneer motioned for that miner to come over to him. And he said to the man, Do you have enough Money to pay for this slave for the price that you bid. And the man opened the bag that one of them he had that was full of gold that he discovered in California. He said, yes, I've got the money. And the auctioneer said, well, you have won the bidding. The story goes that the little girl walked down the steps of the platform And then she walked away down the street with that miner. And then they stopped in front of a store, and the miner went in there, and he was talking to the clerk. 
And then the miner pulled out some more gold out of his bag and gave to the store clerk. And the store clerk walked out and brought back some papers. And the store clerk signed the papers and then the miner signed the papers. Quickly the miner walked outside and he went to the little girl and he said, Here, young lady, are your freedom papers. Here's your freedom papers. I purchased you, and now I'm giving you your freedom to go free. The little girl was stunned. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to respond. And the little girl said, you bought me? You bought me to set me free? And she continued saying that over and over. You bought me to set me free? And the little girl, with tears streaming down her face, said to the man, All now that I want to do is to serve you because you bought me to set me free. God's grace transforms us. God's grace teaches us to live the Christian life. God's grace gives us a bright future. And God's grace sets us free from the slavery of sin and places us in the family of God and now we have a new master. And we can't pay Jesus back for our salvation, but we certainly can serve Him and honor Him, giving thanksgiving for His amazing grace. Let's stand to our feet. Would there be one here today and God spoke to your heart and you'd like to receive God's gift of amazing grace? You'd like to be saved. You don't fully understand. You don't fully know. But you'd like to receive God's gift of grace. I want to invite you to come as we sing this invitational hymn. Have you got a burden in your life you'd like for me to pray with you about? You come when we sing this invitational song. You have an, any need in your life that you would like to come pray about, this altar is open. Let's sing our invitational hymn, Brother Shannon.